Welcome once again to Fort Knox. I am John Fort here this time with Sanjay Merchandani, the CEO of Commvault. Um, Sanjay, welcome, first of all. And then uh, second, I always like to start the same way, which is asking about today's toughest problem. I've been uh, interviewing, it just so happens, a lot of CEOs in a sort of recovery, data recovery space. And uh, there's more to it than just backup these days in the age of, of ransomware and all kinds of attacks. So how would you frame the toughest problem that you're working on? We, we work on one problem. We help our customers protect their data against anything in a difficult world. And I emphasize difficult because data has never been more valuable to a company and possibly more vulnerable to your, to your um, point about ransomware. But we also have things like Hurricane Ian that ran across the country you know, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so whether it be insider error, whether it be a hurricane, natural disaster, or it be cyber, our job is to protect our customers' most valuable asset, most fluid asset, which is their data. So we think solving hard problems with data is the most difficult problem. How do you differentiate from so many companies and, and you know, newer companies that have come along in the cloud era that are working on solving the same uh, problem? Well, it's all about the approach and it's all about a track record. So we've been around for 26 years. We went a public, I don't know, shy of 20 years ago, 17 years ago. Um, we are completely, uh, you know, all, 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 all the details about our business, our, our profitability, our revenues, our strategy are out there. We're one of the few, um, we're probably the only data protection company of our scale that's public uh, today. It's a tough business and we separate ourselves in a few different ways. One is the technology. At the, at the heart of it, we're an engineering company. We build elegant solutions to hard problems for customers and, that, and those solutions are all about their data, data protection. So first of all, you know, being an innovation first, engineering first company. The second really is a core philosophy in, in the way we build product, which is no workload left behind. So it's not about chasing the new cool workload that, that may be out there, which runs 0.001% of a customer's infrastructure, but really end to end looking at everything, the things they're working with today, that run their businesses today and where they're headed to be one step ahead. So our ability, you know, no, no workload left behind. And, and the third is really, we are maniacally focused on the customer experience, making sure that our customers, um, when they, when they entrust us with mission critical capabilities for their data, that we stand by them through it and we do it every day with ransomware or anything else. So it's, we keep it simple and, and we do one thing well. And so um, when you've got customers that haven't completed uh, a transformation to the cloud era, to storing their data in a way that makes it easier to secure with more modern tools, how do you manage investment in um, cloud-based technologies and techniques versus legacy where some customers probably who have been with you a, a long time uh, have a lot of important data, but requires a, a whole separate approach uh, to treat the right way. You. Yeah. So first of all, I was a CIO for many years um, for a large company and, you know, I was an accidental CIO. I, I didn't, mean to be a CIO, I was tapped on the shoulder and, and I got a ringside seat to how IT, the problems IT has, the things they have to deal with. And most companies that have been around more than a, a few weeks have, have generations of systems, have versions of systems. And it's not about just rip and replace. I'm gonna take out my mission critical supply chain and just move it off to the cloud. It's a journey and we respect the journey. So. We do best to breed on on premise, and we couple it with the best, you know, SaaS cloud-based capabilities. And it's a no compromise architecture. And you know, with the, you read any of the analysts uh, that look at that look at us, we are always in the top right-hand corner of the top right-hand quadrant, because our capabilities are cloud first. I mean, um, Giga did, did did a survey recently, and whether it's virtual, whether it was cloud or it was edge, we were number one in all cases. And so it's about making sure that you naturally lend yourself. To the workload as opposed to artificially lending yourself to the workload. So some of the more the newer companies don't necessarily respect what customers are running their business on. They're just thinking about where it's going. Well, it could take two years, three years, five years. 
Okay, so the journey is a long one. It's not like you snap your finger and you've got all the resources, all the budget, and all the applications that you were running your business on available over there. It's a journey. So as long as you respect the journey that customers are on, you're relevant. What do you have to do acquisition-wise, um, strategically, being already public, especially at a time when valuations are starting to come down, markets are volatile? Are there opportunities for you to grow through M&A and gain some advantage um, from your more longstanding position when it comes to technology as well? As a company, we've historically uh, built a lot of our, most of our own technology. We've partnered well and we've built well. Since um, I came in shy of four years ago, we've acquired uh, two assets, two very strategic assets. We bought um, a storage layer that we needed for our hyperscale. It's, it was called Hedvig, the company. It's completely integrated into our offering, our, our composite offering for customers um, you know, our, in our appliance. Uh, and then more recently, we bought an exciting little piece of technology uh, that we've called ThreatWise. Uh, and, and what this does is allows our customers to intelligently manage and deploy decoys in their network, in their environment, so that as ransomware starts making its way through left to right, our technology sort of gives you a high fidelity signal and allows you to sort of take a step back and say, hey, if they're in the network, have they gotten to my backups? Have they gotten to my data? What data might, they ha might, might have been compromised? So it gives you an early warning indicator, a very loud signal that allows you to make, you know, have a better backup. So the technology is very exciting. Um, <clears throat> and you know, it, it, it allows us to get in the front end of the customer's uh, protection. What, um, what's your geographic strategy with your workforce? I understand that you're in Miami, the company is headquartered in New Jersey. Certainly you've got uh, people in a lot of different locations. Hybrid work, remote work ha has recently come in, in vogue once again, but there are challenges that come with it too. How do you approach it? You know, it was fortuitous. We've always been a remote company. We've had a headquarters. We've had people that had offices, but we also had a very large percentage of our uh, our employee base that was either distinctly remote in another country or working out of California or working from their homes. We've always had that capability. We've always supported that capability. Um, with the pandemic, obviously, you, you had a quick restart and you had to think about how, how this all panned out and, 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 you know, whether you could, how do you, what's the new operating model, if you would, for your company. And for us, it was, um, first, we had to help our customers become productive and efficient remotely. And so we focused on that. And then we made sure all our technology was remotely managed, remotely installable, remote everything. And so that was a quick turn for us, for our customers. And then we decided that if we could run through the pandemic remotely, we're going to give our employees the choice of working the way they'd like to. And so today we're, we're hybrid, even I'd say we'll tilt more on remote. Um, and we encourage employees to get together, to collaborate, to, to celebrate, to you know, get to know each other, onboard each other. Um, so it's, we've kept it super flexible and, and it's working really well for us. And now as we approach the end of the year, we've got more and more enterprise software platform conferences. You know, we just have Google Cloud this week. AWS is coming up in uh, December. Um, you know, Oracle's coming up uh, later on this month. Next week. Yeah. Next, next week. week I think. Yeah. Um, in Vegas all week. So these hyperscalers, when it comes to Amazon, Microsoft, um, Google, are sometimes prone to tip into uh, partner territory, particularly when it comes to things like backup, recovery, um, and, and try to eat their lunch. What's your approach um, to, to continuing to, to thrive and keep your customer base as these uh, increasingly powerful scaled players move into your territory? I think they all know that what we bring to the table, Commvault brings to the table, is our complex workloads that come from on-premise, coexist in a hybrid world, work with multi-cloud, 
And customers are looking for ubiquity. Customers are looking for that ability to be able to be flexible between clouds, between on-premise and clouds. And we bring that. Just as a data point, in the past couple of years, uh, roughly, I'd say maybe three years, we have moved over three exabytes of data into the public cloud providers. And for them, utilization workloads, our workloads utilize the commitments that customers made to them in a, in a, in a, in a good way. And so it's actually a win-win for us and for the customer. So that we help the customer, you know, really get value out of the cloud um, and the cloud providers see the value we bring and, and we have that trusted relationship on both sides. So done right, it's a win-win relationship, win-win-win. Done right, yeah. Um, you, you always go through these periods of, uh, of consolidation and challenge there. So we'll see easy. how it goes. Yeah, It looks easy, but it's not easy. You know, we support thousands of workloads and we support multiple destinations and the security protocols that go with it, the cost management that has to be built in because each environment has its native capabilities. Um, it's taken us, you know, it's, we've been in this business for 26 years and we've learned a thing or two on how to, how to get that done. So, you know, if, if you do one thing and hopefully you do it well, um, it's, it's not as easy as it looks. Right, right. Um, so I've, I've learned a bit about Commvault and uh, your strategic position. want to talk more about that in a bit, but now I also want to learn more about you. So tell me, uh, start from the beginning. Where, where were you born? Tell me about household, parents, any siblings? Born in the subcontinent, the Indian subcontinent. I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. I still have my parents uh, in my life. I have two siblings, an older brother, a younger sister, both extremely gifted. I was in the middle. That's a different conversation. Um, but that's a that's a good conversation. That's a long conversation. Are you are you the are you the peacemaker in the middle? I am the peacemaker. Um, some might say I was the troublemaker, but I think I'm more the peacemaker. I prefer that. Um, had a had a, had a my parents had a tremendous have have a tremendous influence um, in who I am and how I live my life. Um, and my and my daughters. I have two grown daughters. Uh, they're very close to their grandparents, um, and had a very normal, you know, very normal in my mind, normal uh, upbringing. Except we traveled a lot, and my dad had a was in the shipping, ocean shipping business, but but on land, not he was not on on the uh, on the vessels. And as his career progressed, we we went from port to port in India, and it, it, it was That's like normal, we, you know, but my life was normal. <laughs> We got up, we went someplace, and I got to, you know, three, four years there, and you made new friends, you got to a new school, new language, um, and you learned to, you learned to really figure that out. I figured that out. New and, language? Yeah, because what happened back then was uh, the school system you had, you know, the school system I was in was in English, and then you had Hindi, and then sometimes you had a third language, the regional language. And so, you know, if I was in, uh, in Chennai, we were, I had to learn Tamil whether I'd done it before or not. And when I moved to Calcutta from there, I had to learn Bengali, whether I'd learned it or not, you know? And so you had to pick up and you, you, you became a bit of a survivor. Um, but it was great because I had, a, I, you know, I didn't know it, but I came up with a formula. You make two friends, you got 20. And then once you, once you make that connection, you're in it, you're, you're, you know, you, you find a way and, uh, and you, and you find, and I've got friends from all walks of life from all different schools. Um, you know, and I left home at, I think 18 and came to the States. So, you know, so that was... during that period when you're a young person traveling around so much, the making friends part and learning the formula for that is great. How do you keep from becoming transactional in your relationships and sort of knowing that, Hey, this isn't going to last long. So it's fun. It's fun for now, but I'm not really going to invest too much in this. But as a kid, I didn't know they weren't going to last long. You know, when when you when you make friends, it's in the moment. You're you're you play together, you you hang out together, you get in trouble together. You're just sort of you know you're you're in school all the time. You know, so it it was it it, it was from on the moment, and it was the way it was. Um, I'm I'm all about connections, and personally, that's just you know if I if I make a friend or I build a relationship or a partnership or a customer engagement, I'm I'm all in. I have to. I I want to see it through. I want to make sure I'm there. I'm present, um, and even even in the role I have today, you know, this, this, in my mind, the one thing I have to do and do every day and do well is connect. Well, um, then what was the toughest move? In 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 growing up, 
Yeah, the, the time was, when maybe you weren't thinking about the fact that you had to move on from this one, but then you did, and it was hard. I, you know, I think it was when I was, I don't know, I forget now, maybe 12, maybe 12, maybe 11, we moved from, from Calcutta to back to Bombay, which was home, which, which was home before we started moving and then came back. And the toughest thing was I was in seventh grade and I had to learn a whole new language and, and be proficient at a, at, a, at a high school level in three years. I had to learn Marathi or I had to learn Sanskrit and draw a parallel to Latin, right? I memorized my way through those, those three years. Like literally, I, 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 I memorized my way through uh, NA minus. And, and it was hard. I mean, I probably spent 80% of my time memorizing that one subject and 20% on everything else. <laughs> and so, you know, but that was hard. You know, that was, you know, that was, some, and back then it was, there was no choice. You had to do it. And in a competitive school system and, and system for kind of getting into applying to colleges, it must have been extremely, yeah, it's pressure. Yeah, and it's make or break. One exam makes it. You know, it doesn't matter what you did all the way up to that exam. The board exam, as, as it was called, as, as it is called, defined your, your ability to get into schools in, you know, wherever you wanted to go. So how did all of that influence where you saw yourself going um, post high school as a kid? You know, it's, I was, I was bookended by two very gifted siblings. My brother just gifted at anything he put his hands on, you know, like sculpting, painting, cooking, writing. It didn't matter. He just, anything he tried, he got really good at really quickly. And then I had a younger sister who, who's a natural leader. And, you know, she just, people follow her. And I look at this and I go, everything I do, I got to work ultra hard at, you know, to just to be, just to, just to, just to qualify. Um, and, you know, it was, I lost my track, turn of thought, sorry. No, we were talking about um, how you framed your decisions about yes. what Thank to you. do after yes. high school and where yes. to go. And, and what happened What happened was the choices at the time were primarily, okay, either you go become an engineer or you become a chartered accountant or you become a doctor. Those were the three bold choices. I had no interest in being a doctor. I thought chartered accountant, fine, but... I didn't even know what that was. And being an engineer was exciting, but I wasn't sure. So I just wanted choice. And back then choice wasn't a thing. So a friend of mine was applying to the US. Um, I borrowed her dog-eared SAT book and went through it a couple of times, uh, found the 20 bucks to apply and applied. And the only restriction I had for my father at the time was I have two sisters in New Jersey, so applied somewhere close to my, to, you know, in case you get in, be close to family. I'd never been to the U.S. I got accepted to Drew University on a full scholarship. Uh, that was my choice. I said, I'm going. And my dad said, well, in India, you'd graduate in three years. In the U.S., you'd graduate in four. So I would like to see you graduate in three years. I had no idea how that was even going to be possible. Uh, <laughs> but I did. I, I just worked. I just worked through it. And I ended up. Um, in a great, great liberal arts school that taught me so much. And, you know, it was the sort of the launch pad for, uh, for everything. Then I went on to get my MBA, which, um, which my brother put me through school for. And, and the rest, you know, I look back and I'm blessed. Um, to tell me about what you learned about, I mean, for one, you're staying in one spot for a while. For another, in a liberal arts school, um, there's a kind of community living uh, that I think is, is even pretty intense for people who aren't used to moving around a lot. So um, this is a different culture, a different country, and you're not moving around as much, uh, having to switch languages all the time. What what did that build into you? It actually, it gave me versatility. I mean, I, I was comfortable with any kind of roommate from any part of the world or food. I, I enjoyed it. I thrived on the on the diversity of what the world was throwing at me. I mean, to to make to make money, you know, to give myself a little bit of a lifestyle in university, I learned how to make pizza. And I would I would make pizzas two nights a week and I'd deliver pizzas two nights a week. And you know, and the tips were great. And I made friends delivering those pizzas. So it was all an experience that, you know, I I am very happy I got. Okay. And I look back and I don't have a day's so, regret. 
So you got through school in three years on full scholarship, entrepreneurially making and delivering pizzas. You were doing all that? It wasn't so much entrepreneurial. I learned there was a pizza place and they, they, they were, they were, you know, right attached to school and I needed a job. And, and I, and he said, you want to learn how to make pizzas and deliver uh, them? And okay. I said, okay, that's it. And I, I'd never made, I'd never toasted bread. I mean, let alone make pizzas. So, you know, it was, it was, it was a learning experience. Right. No, it makes sense. Um, and, and so uh, after that, are you more focused on exactly what it is that you want to do? Or is it more that your horizons have opened up and you want to do a lot of things? So it was um, it was the early days of, of personal computing and graphical computing. You know, you're talking back in the mid 80s. And so I get out of grad school. I get a job where I'm sort of like, I don't know, IT manager in a, for an integration of one of the the regional phone companies they made an acquisition i was in the acquisition team i was doing all the you know the, the basic work on systems and tools and i realized that i like technology but i didn't like writing technology i like working with it i liked working with people to use technology better than coding and i did a, a few years of coding um yeah, it was all right for me but it, i found it better to take the solutions that help customers shape things so then I, I slowly started honing in on the fact that i liked working with customers um with technology and obviously i was proficient, I was good enough with the tech that I could, I could be credible and, and build a career around it. Um, and and I, it sort of fell into place. And I always took, I always sort of found myself more intrigued with, you know, with roles that were less defined so that I could have some, some fingerprints on them. Um, my mom was always in my ear growing up, but, you know, take some risks, be an entrepreneur. And my dad was a nine to five corporate executive. So I had him on this side saying, be secure, be safe. And and so I would I would I followed the secure safe, but I but I tried to take opportunities that allowed me to to try out things, you know. And you you took opportunities in different places around the world. Why is that? Well, I think it was in my blood, you know, moving around and, and seeing the world. I enjoy seeing the world. And I'd just gotten married, um, and we said before we you know the kids start forming roots not that i that ever stopped my parents from moving me around but you know just just in case they want to stay in one place let's let's go and see the world and and we kind of sort of packed our bags and ended up in dubai we had some family there and we said let's try dubai and dubai back then was nothing like what dubai is today and um we set up shop i was working for arthur anderson learning consulting skills and then from there went on to microsoft when microsoft was a little company and then, you know, just kept moving. And I uh, spent five years in, in Dubai, in the Middle East, learned a lot, um, and then went on to India as country manager, which was the most envied job, I thought, in Microsoft, because you were like the CEO of your business, and, and then moved on. Tell me about Microsoft during that period you were there, um, you know, like 11 years, because it's sort of the, the rise and the cautionary stagnation one could argue, because this is the period right after Windows 95, when Microsoft is taking over the PC and then looks across and says, you know, to, to crib from the old Tootsie Roll commercial, whatever it is, I think I see becomes a PC to me, right? There's going to be auto PCs and pocket PCs and home PCs. And it, it, it didn't quite work. Microsoft missed mobile in, in that time frame, succeeded with the Xbox, but there was sort of a a malaise that set in. What did you notice about the the rise and what worked and sort of the, the stagnation that can set in with success? You know, they were great years for me. I learned I learned more about operationalizing a business at in my, you know, it was like I would have paid to learn what I was of what I was learning. When I watched um, when I watched executives like you know Steve Ballmer reviewing a business. Uh, the thoroughness, the, the 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 perceptive capabilities around what 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 was being said versus what was might be you know just just knowing the nuances of everything of the business, the detail. I mean, it was. I mean, I learned nothing in my MBA compared to one mid-year review at Microsoft. You know, I mean, I would put it in perspective, and I would. I mean, there was those were learning experiences like like none other. Also, it was a young company. They took chances on people with like myself, which 
you know, I, I, I didn't know many things because the world was changing so fast and they needed people to take them on and take them to a point, whether it's mobile, whether it was the Explorer, you know, whether it was server technology, these opportunities came up and, and my nature was to take stuff that wasn't fully defined so I could go have some fun with it and I'd grab them. Um, I learned, I learned every day at that company. They were, you know, some of the smartest people in the world that I ever had the opportunity of being around with there at the time. And they moved me to India to run India. India was a business this big today. It's billions. Um, we, we grew it. We, we grew the Indian partnerships, you know, with the TCSs of the world, the Wipros of the world, the HCLs of the world, just really as they were beginning to, to come of age and, you know, just partnering with them. And then I got promoted very quickly to go run South Asia out of Singapore and then, you know, and then uh, Asia Pacific, uh, Japan for services. And I, and what I started noticing was that my job got easier. And, you know, it, I, I just felt like I could do more even though the company was not short of opportunity and, and in no way was I be pushed out or I was just, I, I could do more. And then there was this nagging thing in my head. Could I do it outside of Microsoft or is it Microsoft that's just making me successful? And, you know, the brand, the, the capabilities, it, it was a great company that, you know, they persevered with products, even if it, the initial ones weren't, you know, versions weren't. I learned how to invest in technology with a long haul, how to think about it over a longer period of time. There was a lot of learning you know, a lot of learning. And then I, I self ejected because, and I went to EMC after that and our chairman there and, and CEO Joe Tucci said to me, as he was, as I was walking out of his office from the interview, he said, Sanj, if I get, I, I think I could get you in here, but can I get the Microsoft out of you? Okay. Can you be the person in this environment? Can you be successful? And that was a challenge for me. I wanted to be able to, you know, evolve into a new environment, uh, into new business and, and be able to do it again. So, you know, I hope I answered your question on Microsoft. You did, but I want to spend some more time there because um, I, I covered Microsoft during part of that period, during the latter half of that period from around 2000 uh, to 2006. And there was a lot of good happening in the company, a lot of the foundational groundwork that allowed Microsoft to have the success in cloud that they're having right now. Mm -hmm. There were some right mm -hmm. ideas around .NET and what became Windows oh, yeah. 10, but initially sort of didn't work quite right. And a lot of people were, you know, bad mouthing Microsoft and saying it, a bit, but there were some also some things in terms of focus, um, in, maybe in terms of focus on upstart rivals, whether it was Google mm -hmm. or other, Linux. that, that Linux. was off. Yes, Linux, that, that was off. Um, the, the, the us versus them perhaps, or the, I don't know. What, what, what did you, ca characteristically, what had gone a little I mean, sideways? Yeah, there was, there were some businesses that, that were early investments. I mean, if you think of mobile, I mean, some of the mobile devices that Microsoft had back when mobile first started surfacing were, were, were pioneers, the tablet. I remember having a Windows-based tablet that was, you know, had ink. So it was actually, you know, I'm sure you remember that. I mean, they were, they were very, but they were heavy. And they were, you know, slow, but it was the function of the time. But the the innovation around ink was was phenomenal. Or I was there when we launched server technology. And, and you know, and of course, Sun was at its peak. You know, Linux was coming out and people would be like, NT was not there. You know, that's what, you know, remember that, you know, but you, you fast forward. And, and the biggest challenge we had in the field was building credibility for Microsoft in the enterprise. You're the PC company. You build games. You know, what are you going to tell me about servers and email and, and, and things like that? .NET was a big turning point where, you know, where the coding, the coding principles really helped um, solidify its, 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 its viability. Like this stuff works. This, can, this is really, you know, you're decoupling things and, and making them easier to use. Um, you've got, you fast forward today, and it's not been that long, you know, what, 15 years, 20 years. You talk to CIOs today. Microsoft Azure gets a lot of kudos for being enterprise great. Same company, short window. And so persevering, making sure it works, you know, coming back to it over and over again, not taking a short-sighted view on it. Um, those are great things. And there were, there were some other things that, you know, maybe, maybe towards the end, I, I saw a lot of dashboards and I was like, I want to go see customers. So that was my, that was my personal, that was all me. You know, I'm not saying dashboards are bad, but I, I wanted to spend the field. I wanted to spend more time with my customers and hearing their their issues and how they were using the technology. And um, 
and I went to a company that was absolutely obsessed with customers, EMC, obsessed. Um, what, what you went to EMC also at a time when storage was changing pretty rapidly and, and EMC, of course, later on had its iterations and, uh, and being part of, of larger things. Uh, what was the most important technological transformation happening during your time there? I mean, just um, the scale. So, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of workload, do we have the right type of storage for it? Whether it was the Symmetrics at the time or our Clarion technology, or we got Isilon, or we got the backup stuff, you know, the, we got RSA technologies, the end-to-end -end, um, capabilities of the company to help customers. And, you know, I think the feather in the cap for Joe was the VMware. Uh, you know, acquisition and making that wholesome, like the whole thing come together as a strategy. I mean, um, very, very different from what I had, I'd lived for 12 years or 11 years. You know, we, we built everything ourselves, more or less. At EMC, we had a good mix of both. And I mean, I learned more about M&A and integrations and, and things. And then, you know, I was at the time running international development, which is really building out our assets overseas outside of the United States where we had a disproportionate amount of our revenue at the time in the US um, versus IT spending. And the goal was there's a lot of opportunity outside the United States. So my primary charter was to go help the company be more relevant internationally. And then they added, uh, I did corporate strategy. And then if that wasn't enough, one day I got tapped on the shoulder and said, you gotta be the CIO. So at that point I knew I'd upset someone um, because you know CIO was the standing joke, right? Career's over. And I'm like, what did I do? And anyway, uh, probably the best thing that ever happened in my career off, besides this one, it, get, it got me ready for this job. Um, and So it, I actually hadn't heard that before. CIO career is over. That's pretty <laughs> oh, yeah, funny. No, I had CIO friends who sent me that email. You know. yeah. <laughs> um, why, why wasn't your career over? Because, you know, when I, when I took the job, I, I asked Joe, one, I said, Joe, one question. I'll, I'll figure it out. I mean, I'll go figure out the job. But why me? Like, what do you want from this? And he said, I want bragging rights. I want my IT organization to be the best in the world. We're a tech company. We need to be the best at what we do. We need to showcase what we do. And that was the, that was the clue for me. And I proceeded to, I knew nothing about IT. John. I was a field guy. I was, you know, a biz dev guy. Um, and the people that, that I, I was suddenly in the room with in IT, had more IT in their pinkies than I would have in a lifetime. There was no way. So for me, it was about learning from them. But what I brought to the table was, let's run IT like a business, not like a service delivery center or, you know, or just we, we will deliver what you want from us. Let's run it like a business. Let's have some, you know, that, that's the only way you're going to have a voice at the table. And so we built a program um, called IT Proven, which effectively meant that we would dog food everything the company built and run it in real world environments with real cost models. I paid for everything. I didn't get anything free. And we would then take that and package it up. And we weren't marketeers, we were IT. And my IT professionals, my seniors would get up there in front of customers in the briefing center and talk about how we do IT, the mistakes we make and the, good, the things we do right. It became one of the best selling machines for, for the company. But in the process, we really took the brand of IT inside of a tech company, which is really a hard job because everybody's a technologist, and gave it gave it some great respect. It, I, I also learned that there were a lot of learnings in that job. Um, one was IT looks super easy from the outside when you're selling to them, you know, because you say, oh, you can here's the build, and here's the deploy. But on day one, when stuff has to run with environments that don't talk to each other or don't build for each, it's a you got to have a lot of respect for the folks that get that stuff to work. So that came through in, in the job I do today, which is let's design for the IT professional. Let's not design feature functionality that looks good to you. Let's make sure it works for them, okay? The second is I got to see everything from the factory floor. We built, we built storage devices, everything from the factory floor to the boardroom. And as a CIO, I didn't know that going in, but it was the single best grooming ground if you ever wanted to be a CEO. There was very little you didn't see. And I couldn't do it at 30,000 feet. If I'm putting on a new ERP system, if I'm putting in a new sales automation system, if I'm putting a new mobile you know, connect, connection system, I got to be in the weeds with it. Okay. And at that point, somewhere in there, I realized, hey, I, I, maybe I want to be a CEO someday. 
you know, and it was what went from being like initially like, oh my gosh, this is a this is going to be tough, and it was tough, but it turned out to be personally for me um, one of the best choices I was ever given. Well, it wasn't really a choice. Joe just told me to go. <laughs> and you led into where I was going to go next, which is the CEO path. How did Puppet happen? Puppet happened on a Saturday morning. I got a call from, um, you know, uh, a placement uh, agency, a placement company that that called me in Singapore. I was based out of Singapore and said, hey, would you would you be would you consider this? And that turned out that I knew someone on the board that had put my name forward and they called me and I was intrigued. And I was about done with my tour of duty in, with VMware in Singapore. I'd, I'd promised in three years. I was I was at that point. I wanted to come back to the states, and uh, and of course I could have come back with VMware. But VMware was just getting bigger with the with the Dell, um, you know, acquisition of EMC. I wanted something smaller. I wanted to I wanted to sort of really own the whole thing. And and it was a late stage company. It was it was a market leader in what it did in automation, uh, open source, a whole new space for me so it seemed it seemed like the right thing and i and i'm glad i took it now um our questions about timing on the family side i imagine maybe then was a convenient time uh to move but also the company puppet itself had just kind of been about to ipo and then didn't and then uh, so it, it was kind of and and was downsizing there were some complicated things happening what was it like to step into that you know, it was interesting. The and it was another learning learning lesson for me. But as I came into into Commvault, because when I came in, they were leaders, pioneers in infrastructure as code as a concept, where you can you can programmatically manage your infrastructure, and 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 you know config management. And it was it was magnificent technology, and and it had created an entire space. So you could automate thousands of servers and thousands of storage devices and and provision them and do all that. By writing code, and and it was a it was a wonderful piece of technology, and it was open source, and so you know it had there were people all over the world that I had met that knew Puppet that used Puppet, and so when I came in, of course there was work to do. The found we had a you know the founder was in the uh, was running the company, and it was a decision they made that they want to bring in a somebody from the outside, and I came in and we we took stock. You had to reshape your your priorities, and you know, um, and we, we we grew the company. Very, very successfully. But then as we were looking at, okay, what are our, our options? Uh, we went through another dip. The, the IPO market went through, if you remember at the time, you know, another uh, dip and, this, and the bar just went up. You know, I think it used to be roughly 100 million ARR, you know, growing at certain percent. It suddenly popped at 200, 250. Um, and that took, that would take another three, three years of commitment on my part. And, um, and I, I and I had an honest conversation for it, and 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 just so happened, it just so happened, Commvault came calling, and I and I uh, I thought it was time. And that maybe leads to um, a question that I, I like to ask about what I call Death Valley, uh, lowest point, because I think there's a lot to learn from how one gets through that. So through this whole career and period what would you say was was there some point where you hit a wall and you thought maybe this isn't uh working out the way i planned i need to uh, change direction dramatically what what was the biggest sort of death valley moment um you know i'd say there's two types one was when i was at microsoft i it was you know more or less the only company i'd ever worked for and and i and I kept asking myself, it was like a little bit of soul searching at that point, you know, can I do this without Microsoft? Can I, you know, how, what, what would my path be outside of it? And so that was a deep soul searching moment. And, you know, having one of the senior most roles in the field um, at the time at a reasonably young age and to walk away from it um, was hard for me. It was a, you know, my kids knew nothing else. My little one was was we call, we used to call her the Windows ninety five baby because she was born right around the time of Windows ninety five, and you know, um, it was our life. It was everything we did, and and I decided to go to EMC and and they go, what does EMC do? And I said they build storage. You mean like thumb drives? And you know, and you know, and then, and of course they're both in tech today, so it's a whole different conversation. But um, but that was that was a tough personal decision. But but I think you know. Death Valley for me, like if you look at me, you know, like professionally, what what 
really made me soul search everything was when I was CIO and one of our subsidiaries, RSA, got got breached. And it was, you know, back then it was one of the, it, it wasn't fashionable to say I got hit by ransomware. You know what I'm saying? It was it was rare and it was, un, these were uncharted sort of, it was uncharted path. And, and without getting into the details, because it was a different company at a different time, but the learnings are perennial. You know, the, the impact it has on your life is, is something when people today ransomware wash things, whatever it is, if you're selling a server or you're selling backup or you're selling something, I've lived through it. Okay, I, I lived through it. And I know what it does to a company and I know what it does to the IT organization because most IT organizations find out months after it's happened. Ours caught it as it was being exfiltrated. And we did rapid forensics. We got things figured out. We were, we figured out how to call customers, what deal with. Back then, this was uncharted territory. This wasn't defined. But most importantly, what happened was something I call IT collision. It happens even today, where the world has seen thousands and thousands and thousands of, of attacks, which is when you realize you can't access your systems in some form, in some way, security, the security team, the CISO's organization calls the infrastructure team, hey, do we have good backups for this system? And they go, yeah, we do, I'm sure. Um, okay, why? Well, because we just got hacked or we just got ransomed, you know, whatever. And it's, it's, then there's craziness going on because even if you had playbooks and you've practiced this and you've rehearsed this a thousand times, your phone's ringing, it's, it's visible to the world. Today, it's even worse because it takes seconds for the whole world to know that you have an attack. And the IT organization goes through, it's a, it's a punch in the gut because they feel that they let their company down. And these are professionals. They, they, they are good at what they do. And, you know, it's, it's a, it's a leadership moment. It's one where you really see people rise to the occasion and, and show great leadership in way that in uncharted ways. Uh, and, and I, I tell you, there were days when there were, there were days I didn't sleep days because the, the, every minute felt like an hour. Because I mean, I mean RSA is RSA is a security brand, right? It's got a security More cover, so. so it's just, and especially so. is tough to get More reached. So. Yeah, and it was it was, and it, we were one of the first that ever talked about it. You know, it's just they were today. There's reporting rules and you know transparency and all. Back then there was nothing. Okay, and we we had to we had to figure this thing out as we went along, and 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 um. That was a low point, but you know we came out of that stronger, so much so that we could take our learnings and practices to our customers and say, "Well, here's what we learned," you know. And and it, it taught me a life lesson that security needs to be built in, not bolted on. When people talk about bolting on security, and it's not those are not my words. There was, there was the chairman of RSA, Art Coviello. He always said that, and I I love that term because it says it all. You know, you there's always a new vector that pops up that you're going to you can't keep bolting things on. They're going to get through. You got to just you got to build it in. And so for me, the big learning out of that, that, that breach was, was the big learnings were twofold. One, design for the IT professional. Don't design in, a, in an ivory tower. Design for what happens when collision happens. You know, and two, in data protection, security is implicit. How can, you, how, can you, how can you not be secure if you're protected? I mean, it's, you know, when people say, well, this is security and this is protection, I struggle with that. For me, it's really simple. Is, is my data secure? Is my data protected? It's anonymous. Okay. So for me, it's implicit. And that came right out of that learning because you, you can't be thinking about it differently. It's not about they want this asset or they want that asset. They're going to go this way and get whatever asset they want. And it's always the data. So, you know, is it, is it perimeter security or is it data security? Well, perimeter security is moats and walls. Okay, data protection really actually actually begins before the compromise. So that's why we bought this company, Threatwise, the, the decoy company I was telling you about, the you know the cyber deception, because it allows us to really make the backup better, which makes your recovery more secure. Now, from from a management perspective, I imagine the first temptation in a situation like that is not to disclose; it's to defend. Right. Like within any organization, the, the temptation is to default to finger pointing. It's like, well, it wasn't my fault. It was that person should have done this. this person. But if you do that, 
then it actually takes longer to get to a solution, I imagine, and you don't end up at disclosure. You end up looking for who to throw under the bus. How do you, how do you manage a situation like that so that people feel safe enough, focused enough to disclose rather than defend? I'm not an expert on operational you know, um, rigor in this way, but we, we had a very simple thing. We had a theater of operations. Who's the primary, who's the secondary? Who's on point, and then we had a playbook, you know, communication, escalation, crisis management, forensics. We learned that after the fact. We didn't have it before the fact. But today, when we talk to customers, we prescribe some kind of a, um, you know, a playbook that they say, and, you know, put it, make it yours, but also practice it, also rehearse it, because, you know, it, you, you don't know what you don't know. If you've never done it before, you don't want to be, you need to have a little practice before you get out there. Um, and the, the, the truth of the matter, John, is there. Are, while we've been speaking, there's probably more zero-day exploits been created and put in the wild than, than you and I choose to admit. No technology is going to catch everything. What you need to be able to do is have a process that says, I have defined layers of security. I've defined layers of protection, both proactive and reactive. You know, when customers said, well, how do I protect myself from ransomware? I said, the best protection is a great backup. The best protection, even better than that, is a great recovery. Can you actually recover the data that you've backed up? Is the backup that you're making clean? Okay, now we can give you, we, we'll feather in all kinds of capabilities, obviously, you know, whether it's ML and AI and, you know, anomaly matching and, and now we've got threat-wise. But you're, you know, it's a process. And, and you have to constantly think through how, and, you know, how you do this. But most importantly, most importantly, what are the crown jewels you want to protect? Okay, because the assumption is, trust me, this is how I think about it, and I'm not, I'm not one for drama. <laughs> Assume they're in your network. Okay, if it, that's a fair assumption to make. If they're in your network and they're lying low, they're a sleeper cell. When they wake up and they start going left to right, looking for privileges, looking at ways to, you know, move up, move up your your stack. What matters the most? Do you have a backup? Do you have it immutably put away somewhere else? It doesn't have to be complicated. It just needs to be comprehensive and tested. And because the bad guys will get through the light between systems, the light between processes, the light between teams, that's the weak, those are all weak, weak links. So as comprehensive as you can be, the smarter and better your, your protection is. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. So um, you, we've talked kind of around it a bit, but. Bottom line, what's the core belief th that you brought from that experience? Maybe a tool in your toolbox that you can continue to use in your leadership beyond that moment. Um, if, if you were to boil it down, what was the most important thing? I think this, if, if, can I get two? <laughs> this, this, sure, all right. One is people, okay? You could have all the budget, you could have all the technology, you could have all the ideas, you could have all the smarts, but it takes people to make it come to life. Okay, and and I have my respect for an, for the IT team that I was part of at that time went up infinitely because when I saw them kick in and get this done and protect their company and protect their shareholders and and just lead through it, I just sat back in awe because I didn't know. I mean, I yes, I could run interference for them and I could help them, but but it was it was a sight to. To, to see as how, how well they work through the fog and work through the chaos to get to where they needed to get to, number one. Number two, when I was CIO and I had to deal with systems that didn't talk to each other and made promises that didn't materialize, you know, I would get, you know, vendors telling me, well, you could do this and this and this for, to secure yourself, but um, it'll work perfectly on a Tuesday with the sun is shining and it's 82 degrees. Well, those conditions may never occur in, in tandem. So I want my technology to be malleable to the customer because no two customers are the same and no two days for IT are the same. So give them the choice, give them the flexibility to be able to use that technology in the way that, and, and that we, we learned that. And then from that point on, everything we put in place had that, had that malleability that, you know, do I want that to be a part of my operating environment? Do I want it to be operated by someone? You know, just give them the flex, the, design it with that in mind. Um, and, my product teams probably hate me for that, but I do that with them every day. You know, I, I put the lens of the CIO on every day. And I'm like, but how would I use this if I were on the other side? Well, 
you know, and it makes you better people. And, and, uh, you know, a brutal experience where things where it didn't work out, you know, didn't always work the way you expected them to. Yeah. So now I want to come back to um, Commvault today, not just for Q4 of 22, but heading into 23. What's the most important strategic priority um, in, in a time when IT budgets are probably not growing, where the scrutiny on uh, you know, every dollar spent uh, and, and the ROI is pretty high, what's your, what's your strategic priority? Flexibility for my customers. I want to give them flexibility. And commercially, deployment, Styles, whether it's on-premise or off-premise, their work to their pace in the cloud as they wish to adopt it. I want to give them flexibility. Those are working remotely, everybody's doing it. Moving to the hybrid cloud, everybody's doing it. Kubernetes containers, cloud native, everybody's doing it. Okay. But they're doing it at different paces. They're doing it at different risk levels. Okay. How can we help them get there? Um, and I just, I'll give you a, no commercial, but I'll, I'll say to you that our, our, our simple focus area is give them the best on-premise software for workloads that are naturally on-premise and give them the best SaaS capabilities through our metallic product for workloads that are natively, that are native, that are cloud native. Because what, what my competitors do is like, I have only this product, so I'm going to force you to do this this way. And I only have this product, so I'm going to force you to just stay in this little world. I'm saying, why? You know, if you're backing up Office 365, it's probably just natural that you use a cloud native capability to back up a cloud native workload. Um, if you do wish to bring it back on premise for whatever reason, we'll allow you to do that. There's no problem. It's flexible. You can get up and running in days, days with mission critical workloads. You can now protect SAP HANA, Oracle, you know, uh, the, the Azure PaaS layers, mission critical ones in the cloud if you choose to. So our goal here is to give our customers the flexibility and not force them into an architecture or design because that's all I have. Okay, and that means you change your commercial models, you think about things a little differently, uh, your selling motion's different, you know, with, with, with a SaaS engine versus, with, versus software. Um, and we kind of thrive on that. You know, we feel like at the more choice we give our customers in, in their ability to use things, um, the better we do. All right, well, it's, uh, as, as we've said, a challenging, uh, environment and a competitive one, particularly in the space where Commvault is operating. So Sanjay, thanks for sharing with me about uh, Commvault and about your own personal story on Fort Knox. Thank you so much. It's been, it's been fun.